bit about the center. So we have four miles of trails. If you have not come and visited us, please join us. We have so many beautiful trails. Um, and we have, we like to think of it as forest, field, and meadow. We have 365 acres of beautiful, beautiful land. And we do a lot at the center. We constantly have programs going on and we focus on environmental education mostly. And that includes like a couple of different departments. And if you don't know, we have a nature preschool. Um, it's a really amazing concept. The kids are wonderful. Um, every day is an exciting day for them. And it's really, really beautiful. And we also have Camp Schuylkill, very popular. And I think this year it's gonna be incredibly exciting. We have a new camp manager, uh, Justine O'Gara, and she has all these exciting things for the kids to do this summer. So we have some opening spaces. So if you're interested, come send your kids. It's always a good time. And um, this is a great thing that we're doing today. And a great thing to mention is it's Think Wild Month. So every Saturday we had an event dedicated to our wildlife clinic. And we have a table at the front of our center and we are welcoming and encouraging donations because baby season is coming and they are packed and they're busy and they need all the help um, they can get. So however you can help them, please um, donate if you'd like. There's a list at the center and on our social media. And if you are at the center, then you would have seen our new art exhibition. We also have a new director of environmental art, Christina Murray. And um, this, our exhibition, Walking the Edge, has just opened. It's incredibly beautiful. So if you get the chance, please come and check it out. And if you don't know what you're doing tomorrow, um, there is a Walk Around Philadelphia um, event that's on the 24th and 25th, which is very exciting. It's always a fun time. So please, we'd love to see you there. And if you're always thinking of ways to get involved, we constantly have volunteer um, opportunities at the center. The clinic is always looking for volunteers. The center has volunteer opportunities. Um, a lot of Saturdays, we have restoration volunteer work day where we come and work on the trails. And that is always a really good time. Um, we have a really awesome land and facilities team. So if you're interested, please reach out um, and feel free to ask us. We love to have more and more people here. And I know a lot of you are members, but if you are not a member, please join me. Um, our members receive discounts on programs and in the gift shop and advance notice um, of exclusive, sorry, exclusive programs. So please join online. And for the members that are already here, thank you um, and we appreciate you. Um, we're also having our native plant sale come up. And if you want um, to win a plant, you can scan our code here and take our master plan survey. We recently received a big donation and we're updating our master plan and we want you to be a part of it. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. So I'm gonna leave that up for a moment <laughs> if you wanna scan it. Also our executive director, Mike Wildbacker is coming out with a book this upcoming Tuesday on the 28th titled Wild Philly. And it's gonna be sold in our gift shop. So if you're interested, please come check it out. He's put a lot of hard work into it. And this is his beautiful cover. So if you're interested, again, it's available at our gift shop. And uh, um, not, um, sorry, next week's Thursday Night Live is from food deserts to food forests. And we have amazing partners coming and speaking. We have Philly Forests, we have Philly Philadelphia Orchard Project, and we have Get Fresh Daily. And they're all amazing women. And I'm super excited for this, um, this talk. So please feel free to register. The link is now on the website. And yeah, it's gonna be really great. But thank you, that's all we have for right now. I'm gonna pass it on to Sydney and Stephanie. The stage is yours. I'm gonna stop sharing. And it's all you guys. Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties, everyone. So I'm Stephanie Stunden. I'm the director of the Wildlife Clinic. And tonight we're talking about living with urban wildlife. So let, let's just get started. Everybody just sit, think, where are you 
typically picture wildlife to live. You're going to think of an idyllic forest, something like the school kill center, perhaps, where there's trails to walk around, nice, peaceful, quiet. Unfortunately, um, that is that's going by the wayside and urban wildlife are learning to adapt and co-mingle with people in both good ways and bad. As a wildlife rehabilitator, one of the main things we always wish people understood more was that you need to work with the animals and live with the animals because 90 to 95 percent of our patients come to us because of human impact. So I like to add some context to my ramblings and oh, forgot this is a touch screen. So this is Philadelphia. I don't know where everybody is coming in from. So I picked a spot that everyone should be fa fairly familiar with, which is the Philadelphia airport. And the first image we're going to see here is from 1927. So this is the original airport. So then we're going to go to 1972, a little bit bigger footprint. And finally, 2020. So this is just one of a million and 10,000 examples of different parcels of land that have been divided up where wildlife used to live and now have to adapt to interact with us. I mean, in this 2020 picture, you can see they're right along the river, there's marshland, wetland, and that is no longer belonging to the animals. So what exactly is urban wildlife? Now, when you think urban, you think city, However, urban wildlife is defined as animals that occupy and share space with humans. So we're not talking about just cities. We're talking about highway corridors. We're talking about farmland, just like that 1927 picture of the Philadelphia airport. That could still be considered urban because animals had to coexist with the humans that were in that space. Animals have to move or adapt or they perish. So Thankfully, most animals have learned to adapt. And here are just a couple of examples, cute little pictures. So we get hotline calls almost every day, especially in our busy season, of people saying, oh my gosh, there's a turtle in my yard. Where did it come from? Or there's a fox in the middle of the road. It's just standing there and they're all native. A lot of people just don't realize how much we've encroached on the wildlife. And so they're literally in our backyards. And I'm not gonna name every single <clears throat> native wildlife species tonight, but I will go over some in the following slides. And I feel that it's important to take a moment to discuss non-native versus invasive. A lot of people think these are interchangeable, but they're not. So non-native is an animal that obviously does not originate in that area, but it does not compete for food or resources. So they're living among the native re wildlife and they might still have some predators. However, invasive species do not have natural predators. And that also means that they're just gonna keep breeding and multiplying and there's nothing there except humans to take away their multiplying. <laughs> They're also taking all those precious resources from the native wildlife. And a very good example right now are the red-eared sliders. If you go to certain refuges in this area, you might actually see more red-eared sliders than native painted turtles or box turtles because people buy these as pets. They don't realize just how big they get, how old they live, and it's really important that everybody realizes that when you're done with the animal, you don't just dump it in the waterway. So if anyone needs a cause to champion, let's get those red ear sliders out of pet stores. <laughs> so now we're gonna go through a couple of quote unquote native animals to the Philadelphia region. And I'm gonna start with the rock pigeon because they're everywhere in Philadelphia. Now, they are technically called rock pigeons, and all of the pigeons in Philadelphia are feral, but they descended from domestic pigeons that escaped from Europe settlers in 1600. So this is also a great example of the fact that they are non-native, but they're not invasive because they are sadly an excellent food source for urban hawks. They procreate year round, which is very odd for a Northeast 
U.S. bird. So they, they are an unlimited food source, so to speak. And they're called a rock pigeon because their old world counterparts nest on rock ledges and crevices. So in urban environments, that turns into windowsill and building ledges. And they literally build nests with like three sticks. <laughs> they are kind of lazy nest builders, but they are amazing, excellent baby hiders. Um, nine out of 10 times we get a call for a baby hawk. Turns out it's a baby rock pigeon. And honestly, before I had this job, um, before I started volunteering, I didn't know what a baby pigeon looked like. So down in the bottom right corner of your screen, that's what a baby pigeon looks like. And they are called squeakers because they don't quite have their coo yet and they literally squeak. And they stay with mom until about their teenagers, teenage years and then they go off and hunt and forage on their own. So now if you don't learn anything tonight, you can at least learn what a baby rock pigeon looks like. So now we go through the Virginia opossum, which is almost all of us staff members' favorite, well, one of our favorites. There, I could do a talk completely on Virginia opossum, so I'll try to keep this slide short. They are North America's only native marsupial, and that's including Canada and Mexico. The term marsupial actually comes from marsupium, which is a Greek term meaning little purse. And you're probably thinking, why is this girl talking about little purse? Well, it's because their pouch can hold up to 13 babies. So imagine having a permanent purse attached to your abdomen carrying around 13 babies. It's, it's amazing what these mamas do. So there's also a possum versus possum. You might think they're interchangeable, but they're not. A possum is pertaining strictly to this Virginia opossum species. Whereas possum is actually referring to the brush tail possum of Australia. And while they're both marsupials, they are completely different. Um, the possum is much smaller and a much longer tail, furry. Look them up, they're adorable. Everybody has heard the term playing possum. So they're not actually, quote unquote, playing possum. They're fainting. They're so scared that they pass out. And when they pass out, they actually emit an odor that is similar to rotting. So that way their predators will think, oh, that possum, that possum's already deceased and he's already rotting. I don't want to eat him. So they run away. So that's actually two parts of the mechanisms that Virginia possums have used to thrive in urban settings. A lot of people know that the opossum is nocturnal. So they get very disturbed if they see an opossum during the day. We always get hotline calls. Oh my gosh, there's an opossum out of my backyard and it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Remember I said how they could have 13 babies? It's a lot of mouths to feed. They gotta be feeding all those babies plus themselves. So if they're active in the day, they might just be hungry, foraging, or their den was disturbed. They were just trying to get a nice little day nap in and someone cut a tree down and knocked them along the head. So now they have to go find somewhere else to sleep. Do not be concerned if you see opossums during the day, please. And if you are not enamored by the opossum like we are, I will leave you with, they are an anti-venom phenom. So Virginia opossums actually have a protein that binds to venom of venomous snakes and renders it useless. So this works with rattlesnakes, water moccasins, and copperheads. And science have act, scientists have actually used this protein to make anti-venom. So if you're ever bitten by a rattlesnake or a copperhead or a water moccasin and have to have an anti-venom shot, you should thank the Virginia opossum. So everybody knows our lovable Eastern gray squirrels. And if you are one of those people who love to lay under a tree and watch the birds flit about in the sunlight and enjoy the shade of that tree, you should love Eastern gray squirrels. They accidentally plant thousands of trees a year. They are what we call scatter hoarders, which means when the trees drop their fruit, which is the nuts, they will gather up as many as they can and bury them in different spots. And they're so good at this hoarding that they bury way more nuts than they will ever need. And there's also trees like acorns. They're too heavy for the wind to disperse. 
So it relies on animals such as the squirrel who will take the acorn and bury it, forget about it, and boom, you have a tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anybody, even you just heard from Zaina, baby season is coming. Squirrels are the first mammal baby we receive and they mate twice a year. So they start our baby season and they end our baby season. We will probably start receiving baby squirrels beginning to mid-March, and then we'll take a break and have baby birds, and we'll get them again in late August, September. And it's important to note that if a female squirrel has a successful litter in the spring and their second brood in the fall, if someone perhaps cuts that tree down, and they lose their babies, they won't necessarily go back for those babies because they've already had a successful litter and they're tired. So that's where we step in. We raise the abandoned young. On the bottom here, you see a black squirrel. And a lot of people think black squirrels are actually a different species, but they are melanistic eastern gray squirrels. Melanistic just means they have more melanin, which is dark pigmentation in their fur. And it's actually thought to be a adaptation in colder climates because their fur will hold the sun's warmth during the winter and colder climate seasons. But also we have learned that they tend to congregate in groups. <laughs> There's a large group of black squirrels in Ardmore. There's some in South Philadelphia, but technically you can see a black squirrel anywhere. You can see Eastern gray squirrels. However, Red squirrels are a completely different species and they are much smaller and much feistier, if you will believe that. So red-tailed hawks are pretty much an everyday sight in Philadelphia. And when you're watching an old Western or maybe it's a very patriotic commercial and you hear that infamous cacaws, the eagle swoops past, that's not what an eagle sounds like. That's what a red-tailed hawk sounds like. Bald eagles actually have a very puny, high-pitched squeak. So they decided in Hollywood to steal the red tail's call and use it for bald eagles. If you haven't heard what a bald eagle sounds like, I highly recommend you Google it after our talk. It's pretty funny. This giant animal has such a very high-pitched squeak. Red hawks also great and their courtship is a very large, very intricate aerial choreography dance and it could be confused for fighting. So this time of year, there might not be fighting, they might just be courting. And then a lot of you may remember the famous hawk nest at the Franklin Institute. The female made her nest right outside the conference room on a third floor window everyone was enamored with this family. Unfortunately, she did lose her mate. So she found a suitable stepdad for that brood. And then the next hunt, the next breeding season, the new cup, the newly married couple, so to speak, moved to Eakins Oval by the art museum for their next brood. So even though they mate for life, they will find new partners to keep their line going. And while many people think peregrine falcons are one of the best hunters, which they are, Red tail hawks have been studied in their hunting prowess and they get their prey first try almost 80% of the time. So they're pretty skilled hunters. Which leads me into one of the main adaptations of the red tail hawk. You can typically see them on streetlights. I tend to see them at least once a week in the summer along the school kill expressway on my way home. And this is because when they're in the forest, they're gonna pick a very tall tree at the top of the canopy where they have a 360 degree view. That is the prime hunting territory spot for the red tail. Well, they can see a 360 degree view from a street light. So they've decided to adapt and change their hunting techniques in urban settings. This peregrine hawk, the next picture on the top right, this is actually them nesting in Philadelphia City Hall in 2014. Peregrine hawks in the quote unquote wild would typically nest along rock ledges, crevices, but they've decided that buildings and also under bridges do just as well. They've actually been brought off the endangered list in Pennsylvania because they do so well nesting under bridges and on buildings. 
So I have to include this baby squirrel picture. These are baby squirrels that were brought to our clinic because during a tree, a storm felled the tree and the babies were lost. The finder picked up as much of the nest as they possibly could when they brought these squirrels to us. See that material in the top right corner of that baby squirrel picture? Those are pandemic mask. That is perfect bedding material that mama squirrel thought was perfect for her babies. So this is a very prominent reminder to secure your trash. It is actually pretty lucky that mama or babies didn't get hurt on the strings that are attached to those masks. And you can even see a little bit of orange might even be the cap of a syringe. So please, oh please, secure your trash. And when you have those trash bags out, maybe some yummy burger pieces, you're going to see the famous sanitation workers, which are the crows. They always find scraps. There is even a rehabilitator that specializes in corvids, which crows are corvids. And she teaches her crows as young to dig in paper and plastic. So then that way, no matter where they're released or where they end up, they can always find food. She calls them the McDonald's crows. Now we don't do that, but it is an option because they, will, they won't go hungry. They'll always be able to find food. So as we encroach on the wildlife habitat, there might not always be a suitable den. Well, these raccoons found an amazing den in someone's attic. That insulation sure looks cuddly to me. So that is a good reminder to please make sure all holes in your roof are sealed or you might have some unexpected roommates. And now I'm gonna hand it over to my assistant director, Sydney where she will go through the next couple slides and I can get my voice back. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, fawns. We all know the white-tailed deer. They're infamous for running across the roadways um, right in front of your car. But believe it or not, uh, fawns and deer have a very interesting adaptation with the way that they raise their young. So. Does the mother deer, have actually kind of discovered that where there's humans, there's safety. So where there's humans, there's a lot less natural predators, such as foxes. Um, so they decided that that's a great place to leave their babies. So a lot of times we'll get calls, and you can see in this picture, where um, baby deer are actually left right in front of somebody's lawn out in the open. Um, however, this is completely fine and completely normal. Um, it's normal that the does will leave their babies out in the lawn all day while they're out foraging, um, looking for food and getting their food stores up so that they come by at dusk and dawn to feed their babies. And the reason why it's safe for them to actually um, leave their babies out in the open like this is because these babies don't yet carry any sort of natural odor they aren't able to be detected by any sort of predators like foxes. Um, so they pretty much are safe without that smell. Now the, the mother deer do spend maybe just about a couple hours a day with their babies. And that's because they wanna make sure that they're not attracting any predators. So they will leave their babies in the, in the yard so that they are not attracting any predators with um, the adult's odor. So yes, this might seem a little alarming to most people. Um, a lot of times we'll actually get people coming to the wildlife clinic who are just carrying a baby fawn in their arms because it was abandoned. It was left in the middle of their yard all alone. But the normal occurrence happens all the time. I actually, in my own neighborhood, had to return a fawn where, to where it was found um, in somebody's backyard um, because they didn't know any better. Um, so yes, the fawn is okay, unless there's obviously any sign of injury, um, if it's covered in any bugs or any um, lie eggs that might indicate injury or might indicate that mom has not been around for a while to help groom, or if the baby's been crying excessively for maybe a day or two, that might also be a sign that something's up. But it is a very interesting adaptation for fawns that they can kind of just be out in the open and not have to worry about safety. Can move on. Thank you. Um, so this next slide is super interesting, I think. Um, this is actually a graph of our 
our admissions at the wildlife clinic over this past year of 2022. So we have this lovely system on our computers where we can track all of our admissions and the reasons why they're coming in and different stuff like that. So you can see pretty obviously the largest reason why animals come to us is because they're orphaned. Um, a lot of times we don't know why they're orphaned. So that's kind of where we put them in the system. We just say orphaned. Um, but most of the time animals are orphaned because of human interaction. So they're orphaned because their nest um, got destroyed when someone was cutting down their trees or um, sometimes baby bunnies nests will be destroyed uh, when people are mowing their lawns. Um, and sometimes even nests will be located in people's vehicles and they don't even know it. Um, that happens quite frequently. So a lot of times orphans are human caused orphans. But if you look at the other options up here, some of the other very large um, circumstances of admission are also human caused issues. So you can see we have um, inappropriate human intervention, people thinking that they're doing the right thing by helping this animal when really the animal's just fine and doesn't need any help. Um, you'll see vehicle collision is a very big one. People drive like crazy these days and don't always have enough time to stop when they are driving so fast. And then there's a couple more that we'll go through and talk about a little bit more in depth. Switch, thank you. So some of the top impacts just listed out here. Um, first would be pesticides and rodenticides. So not only do pesticides and rodenticides have an effect on rodents and other pest animals, they actually have an effect on lots of predatory animals as well. So a lot of times um, hawks, foxes, other things will actually ingest animals that have been poisoned by these um, pesticides and rodenticides um, that have not yet passed away, these animals. And then by consuming an infected animal, they are then um, getting themselves sick and that can cause some serious issues. Um, there's the issue of lead toxicosis, which we'll go a lot more into in depth here in the next slide. Um, sticky traps and tape. You can see the picture on the right there is an image of a poor bird that was stuck to a um, lanternfly tape um, that was wrapped around somebody's tree. This happens a lot. Um, unfortunately, sticky traps and sticky tape is um, what we call an indeterminate um, solution. So indeterminate meaning that other things can be impacted other than the um, specific thing that it's trying to get rid of. For example, let's just say you set out sticky traps for mice. The sticky trap may catch a mouse, which is great, but there, that might attract something else to come along. What if a snake comes across that sticky trap and decides it's a free meal? Um, so these indeterminate traps are seriously a, a big problem for our wildlife. A lot of times with the lanternfly tape, a bird will see a lanternfly land on the tape. The lanternfly is not moving. Looks like an easy meal. And that's how the birds themselves get stuck. Um, bird feeders can also have a huge impact. A lot of the times bird feeders are, are a good thing. Oh, I skipped one. Oh, well. Bird feeders are a good thing because they're feeding our wildlife and giving them another food source. But people don't realize that bird feeders need to be cleaned. And they need to be cleaned at least once every week, one week to two weeks. Um, because bird feeders can actually carry a lot of bacteria and disease. One major issue that we have seen quite a lot frequently is conjunctivitis in birds. And conjunctivitis is basically a disease of bacteria in the eyes and it can spread like crazy. So bird feeders are actually a hub for that disease. I skip domestics and pets. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But we all love our pets, but they can get a little aggressive. Um, they have that prey drive that they are instinctively actively trying to use. Um, then there's window strikes. Uh, window strikes are when a bird um, flies into a window. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, decor, lights, and landscaping. You might not realize it, but all of our decorations outside that we put up 
for Christmas, for holidays, they have an impact on the wildlife too. And there's tons more of things that humans can impact wildlife, but we'll get into some of the bigger topics next. All right, so one of my favorite topics to talk about is lead toxicosis. Um, so lead is a completely human-centric issue. Um, but lead toxicosis is caused by lead that's ingested or introduced to the body somehow. Um, and the metal toxins in the lead will start to actually leach into the animal's bloodstream. And that can actually have a serious effect on their health. It'll affect their uh, central nervous system function, which would cause some very disturbing um, symptoms such as um, loss of motor function um, and coordination. It will cause really gross screen diarrhea, um, some anorexia and um, loss of appetite and general weakness. So this, this illness can be absolutely debilitating for animals and it can even lead to death, um, which is very unfortunate. So we have two of our um, recent lead cases. Um, you can see on the left, one way that lead is introduced to our society um, and to our wildlife is through the use of lead bullets. So lead is a very, very cheap form of ammunition and people will actually use those to hunt any sort of small game. Unfortunately, in this case, I don't know who in their right mind would do this, but somebody actually shot this poor pigeon that is in the x-ray here. Um, we knew at the time that he had a fractured wing that would not be able to heal. So unfortunately, this is a post-mortem x-ray. Um, we had to make a difficult decision with him. But after looking at that x-ray, we were able to see that, um, that BB pellet in there. So that would explain not only his um, fractured wing, but he also had some um, strange mentation that was not normal for a pigeon. The goose on the right, actually, we weren't quite sure what was going on with her at first until we were able to do some blood work where we can test and see the levels of lead in the blood in the body. And we got a pretty high number of lead back. Um, and we actually took an x-ray and saw tiny little granules of metal in her stomach. So what it turns out is she was likely grazing on the ground, um, snacking on some grass or something, and may have accidentally picked up something that she shouldn't have. So there's tons of different ways that um, lead can get into their system. So the ammo, sometimes they accidentally consume it. But there's also lots of issues with metal from fishing sinkers that get left behind in the water. Um, a lot of times when metal enters the water, it can actually stay in the water system for up to 100 years um, before it deteriorates. So it's a major issue because that's the water that our animals are drinking. And if they drink contaminated water, that makes them sick. There's also issues with lots of runoff from different pollutants from large factories um, and other just general pollution from litter and other things. Something very interesting is the bald eagle population is actually one of the most susceptible populations to this, um, this issue. They recently did a study in Science Journal where they discovered that about 47% of bald eagles are suffering from chronic lead poisoning, which means that their body has been somehow affected by lead in the past and um, they're still dealing with the symptoms, the issues. Um, to this day. So 47 is almost half of the bald eagles that they surveyed, which is insane. And it's poss possible that they are so susceptible because bald eagles often will hunt in, in um, lakes and rivers where there are fish that may be um, contaminated from those contaminated water systems. And when there is lead in the body, it unfortunately causes depletion in the calcium in a bird's body, which will then have an impact on the ways that they form and create the eggs that their babies are in. It'll make their eggs brittle and more fragile, so they'll break before they even hatch. Now, this story is not one that is unfamiliar in the wildlife world. Um, is 
it's been told a million times the story of Silent Spring. It was a 1962 Rachel Carson um, book that she dedicated her entire research to the DDT pesticide issue and how it was impacting our environment, how it was impacting the wildlife and tons of issues such as that. DDT has since been banned because of its environmental impacts. And now we are starting to kind of have the same comparison where we think that lead is the new DDT because of its environment. Pets and wildlife. Now, don't get me wrong, I love my dog. She's probably upstairs watching this right now. Um, but dogs and cats and all types of different pets have instincts and their instincts are to bite. <laughs> if they see something that is a predator or prey species, they are going to want to put it in their mouth. So a lot of times we will receive these animals at our wildlife clinic. We actually have our numbers here, just how frequently um, we get animals that are caught by a cat or caught by a dog, which is pretty frequent. Um, there's tons of ways to avoid these kinds of interactions with wildlife. Um, we always recommend putting your animal on a leash. Um, a lot of people don't think about putting cats on leashes because it's a little strange, but it definitely makes an impact so that you can have control over where your animal is going. We also say if you are letting your dogs out into the yard to just look out and make sure that there's you know, no wildlife in your yard before you let your dogs out. Do a survey of your yard to make sure that there's no rabbit's nest and to just overall double check to make sure there's safe, everything is safe. We also have a cute picture of a cat on a, go back. <laughs> a cat that's sitting on what is called a catio. Um, it's a really cool thing that people have started doing recently where they will build these nice little patios for their cats so that they're able to be outside and enjoy all of the things that outside has to offer, but still maintaining a barrier between them and wildlife. It is a million times safer um, and it's really cute. Um, we always also, if anybody ever asks if any animal is in a dog's mouth or a cat's mouth, we always tell them to bring in the animal to the wildlife clinic. It's possible that there was no punctures made because we have some gentle pets, but we we find that a lot of times animals' mouths contain a lot of bacteria. So there may have been a transfer of saliva into some of the mucous membranes of the wild animal. So possibly the saliva from their mouth got into the bird's eye or something like that. So we always have these animals come into the wildlife clinic, no matter what, if they're hurt or not, because we want to treat them for any sort of infection that may go on from that interaction. And you can go ahead. Thank you. Next is window strikes. So window strikes happen during the migration season of um, for birds. So migration is generally from, it changes every year because of um, the warming of the earth, um, but it's generally from about April to March to, more like March to May. March to May, <laughs> and then from, from like around September, October time. Um, so that's when the birds are traveling north for the uh, summer and south for the winter. And thousands and thousands of migratory birds will go through um, cities during the nighttime. And the, the, that's when they do all of their traveling. They will do it during the nighttime because it's safest. There's less predators out and they're less likely to be seen by those predators in the night. So windows will unfortunately cause a major issue for these migratory birds because they will reflect off any sort of surface. So it might reflect trees off of their surface. It might reflect light off of that surface. And unfortunately, birds don't have very good eyesight. So they are not able to distinguish a clear surface from a not clear surface. So they, a lot of times bright lights will disorient them and cause them to fly directly into a window. 
Now it's even more confusing because these birds will use their, um, they will actually use the moon as their guide on how to make their way um, back home or wherever they may be going. Um, so by having all the bright lights in the city, it does have a very big effect on how they're oriented. It might turn them around accidentally, might get them super confused. So they um, oftentimes get very lost and very confused. We actually had a long-tailed duck, which is an Arctic species, come through our clinic recently. Um, and we'd like to, we're really not sure what, what happened with him, how he ended up here, but we think that um, he was making his migration back up to the Arctic and he got hurt on the way and possibly because of a window strike or possibly because he was disoriented from the lights that were impacting his prey. But there are ways to avoid these problems. If you see on the picture on the right, that is actually a picture of one of our windows at the wildlife clinic. And we had put up this special tape that has kind of these little stickers on it that make it look like they're, um, it's not so much of a clear surface anymore. So if you have a tiny little pattern on it, it makes it a little bit easier for birds to see. But there's other um, ways to prevent this. You can use a curtain, banners, um, ribbon or string. Even you can use paint or you can use tape to just kind of create a design on your window. You're still able to see through it, but it does help the birds distinguish that as a not clear way to go through. Uh, we also partner with a, a wonderful organization called Bird Safe Philly. Um, every year during migration season, these wonderful volunteers um, go through the city streets and they go through and they collect any birds that may have been impacted by window strikes. And what they'll do is they will take any deceased birds to the Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel and they will actually do some some research on those bodies to see how they were impacted by the window strikes. And those animals that do survive the window strikes are then taken all the way to our wildlife clinic in Roxborough, where we are able to treat them for their injuries. A lot of times um, it's just a quick turnaround. They need some medication to reduce swelling in the head and then they're out of there. We actually had, in this past year, we had an 80% release rate with um, bird safe Philly, which is an excellent number. 80% is very high um, and something to be very proud of. And bird safe Philly also has this campaign called Lights Out Philly. So you might see the picture on the left is this Philadelphia skyline um, and all of the lights are turned off. And this is to help keep the birds from getting disoriented on their journeys. So sometimes turning off a light at night can be the difference between life or death for these birds. So it's a really important campaign and encourage you, I encourage you to look into it if you haven't heard of it already. And we're gonna go back to Stephanie for a little bit more. So thank you, Sydney. Um, my voice is mostly returned. I'm not used to talking this much, so bear with me people. So I would not be doing my due diligence as a wildlife rehabilitator without showing some, at least one case study of where human impact directly affected the animal. And here we have an anesthetized red-tailed hawk. He is still living. He is just has his head covered because he is, again, anesthetized. So we get a call and a local police officer shows up. It wasn't even a Philly police officer. It was a suburban police officer. And he said, I have a hawk here that got caught in some party lights. So this is summer. We're thinking party lights, those big strings of patio. Stephanie, um, I I think we may have lost you. Um, can everyone, can anyone else hear or see Stephanie or is it glitching? No, 
Okay. No, no pictures, no hearing, no slides. They strung them from their back deck to their, the hawk found a very yummy snack and immediately got wrapped up in these Christmas lights. Wing, and that is because the lights were so tightly wrapped around his wing, he could not. Uh, you're back on, Everyone Stephanie. hear me? We lost you, but now you're okay. back. Okay. So I am running low on time. So I'm going to go through these next couple slides pretty quickly, um, just so that, we, that we have enough time for everyone to ask questions. So everyone thinks a humane way to get rid of quote unquote nuisance wildlife is to trap and relocate them. Please just say no. So when you trap and relocate wildlife, you could be taking mom from her babies, which means those babies now have now will probably starve to death or get taken by a predator when they go out to look for mom. It could also be think of it as if you are taken and you're blindfolded and put in a plane and literally dropped in the desert you have no food you have no water you have no cell phone you have no clothes you have no sunscreen that is essentially what you are doing to these animals if you put them in a humane trap take them out to the woods and release them if they're not used to living in the woods if they're used to living in the suburbs where there's trash cans and dumpsters it's kind of a death sentence for these animals to take them out in the middle of nowhere so please do not relocate any trapped animals. So you might be thinking, well, there's that groundhog under my shed. How the heck do I get him out of there? So we always have humane deterrence that we recommend for people when they call us with these issues. And the key components here are noise and motion. So motion lights that if you wave your hand in front of it, they click on. Even pinwheels, I'm talking dollar store pinwheels that you can put in your gardens that they are scary. You can literally string up old silverware that will clatter. Wind chimes. One of the most popular ways, especially for groundhogs, is to set up a radio. Remember what a radio is? Um, put it on some top radio, literally human voices talking nonstop, those animals are going to get annoyed and they are going to vacate the premises. Some people will say to use scents like ammonia rags or um, tea tree oil or mint. We don't always recommend that because they could have um, a detrimental effect and it could accidentally poison different types of animals and insects. So we really focus on noise and motion for our deterrence. And you can find things like this on our website. And also you can always reach out to us via email, which I'll give you at the end. We will happily explain all of these more. So quick ways to help. I know we've gone through a lot of negative in this presentation. There's also some pretty easy things you can do in everyday situations. So I just talked a little bit about closing up those holes. And that is a prime example. This raccoon here made a little den. Now it is imperative that if you do evict some unwanted roommates, that you close up that hole as soon as you know that they're gone. Because if you don't, they're just gonna keep coming. And Sydney mentioned this briefly, but when you go to mow your grass, mow your lawn in the summer, please, please check. Bunny nests are really hard to see sometimes. In that second picture on the top row, there is actually a cottontail nest in that grass. We get a couple of nests every year that have been unfortunately hit by a lawnmower. Some of them are savable. Um, so it's a really easy thing. Just take a quick peek around your lawn before letting those dogs out or getting that lawnmower revved up. You can also use native plants and put them around or you can provide natural habitat such as a bat box. And a great thing about bat boxes is they also provide a non-toxic bug, bug control. If you're kind of sick of all those mosquitoes in your backyard, put up a bat box. And it's a pretty fairly common sight in the city. You're gonna see some tails sticking out of trash cans. Unfortunately, that's inevitable, but your personal trash cans, you can keep secure. You can, and if you have a very smart, crafty raccoon or a possum, you might have to add bungee cords. Really try to keep that trash as secure as possible. And as we've talked about baby season, we highly recommend that you do not do any tree work between the months of March and September. If you need to cut a tree down and you know you have to cut a tree down, we highly recommend doing that 
between November and February because you're, you're not destroying nests. Um, you're, there's going to be squirrel nests, birds nests, all sorts of things. And if you do have to cut a tree down, we know nature happens. Maybe a storm came through, pulled it up a little. You don't want it falling on your house. You need to be safe. Please use a reputable tree company, tree removal service, I mean. They know to check for nest. They know where to look on this tree to check for nest. And then we can keep this all going. We don't have to bring them into the rehabilitator. It's better off for everybody. And I too can be guilty of this. <laughs> Driving above the speed limit, you stay with traffic. You're, you're keeping safe staying with traffic. But however, use your headlights. Go as close to the speed limit as you can being safe. And that is going to save literally hundreds of lives. We won't see those vehicle collisions. You won't have roadkill, which will there, therefore hurt the hawks who are trying to eat the roadkill. It's a full circle, easy everyday thing to just go the speed limit or at least use your headlights, especially at night and especially in inclement weather like rain, snow, ice, all the fun stuff. So we've talked a little bit about how you interact with wildlife and we are there if you need us. These are true wildlife emergencies. If you're ever unsure, call us, email us, text us, we'll go through it with you. These are some good bullet points though to remember that if these are, if any of these are checked off, that animal should be brought to us. If it is still bleeding, if it's been caught, played with, attacked by a cat or a dog, if it's staggering, collapsed, unconscious, convulsing, if it is tangled in something, if there's a jar stuck in its head, or if it's on sticky tape, if it's on a glue trap, please do not remove it yourself. Put something on the sticky surface that is still shown, like a tissue or something, or some oatmeal, something that will take that stickiness away and bring it to us. So we will safely remove the animal without damaging fur or feathers. If they cannot see, if their eyes are swollen shut or very crusty, especially right now, as Sydney mentioned with the birds and the conjunctivitis, Bring them on in, we can fix them up. Or if they have an obviously broken limb, or if you see babies whose parents you, you are known to be dead or have left. The overall rule is if you can safely catch it, it probably needs help. Now this isn't always true with fledglings and everything, so we do highly recommend calling us, texting us, emailing us before bringing us an animal. But in general, these are true emergency wildlife situations. And I know we're almost out of time, so this is the last slide, I promise. As a reminder, we are the Wildlife Clinic at the School Kill Center. We are located in the Roxborough section of Philadelphia on Port Royal Avenue. That is an email address that all of us staff at the clinic can regularly check on a daily basis, and that is our hotline number. Go ahead, take a screenshot of this slide, take a picture, and I will now stop presenting and go to your questions. So Stephanie, I just want to thank you for an amazing presentation and everyone has loads of questions. So I'm going to feed you some of the questions that we have time for. So the first mm -hmm. one is from Ellen and she wants to know what the opossums eat. Sure. So the Virginia opossums are omnivores. So they eat a little bit of everything. They will eat some mice or maybe some hamburger that they found in that trash can, but they'll also eat fruits, vegetables, um, cat, cambium on trees. So they are true omnivores and will eat pretty much everything. <laughs> okay, great. And we're, we're going to try and hit a couple more questions. So Ed wants to know what is the best way with dealing with feral cats? Uh, that is a very good question. And my favorite is TNR. And if you're not familiar with TNR, that is trap, neuter, and release. There are some wonderful organizations in the city of Philadelphia, including Green Street Rescue and even ACCT, who will do this for free. They will even provide you a trap. And why this is so great is because they're going to be less aggressive once they're fixed, and they're also not going to be having up to 20 babies a year, at least. So that is a very good way to deal with them. Also, if you're finding a lot of wildlife around the feral cat colonies, stop feeding them at least for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and that'll help disperse the population. 
Okay, great. Um, and I think this is a really interesting one. So with the bird virus going around, someone's asking if bird feeders should continue to be used or what do you think? Sure. So they they found with the highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, it's not so much in fomites, it's more in feces and secretions, and it's also more in waterfowl and birds of prey, such as hawks and eagles. So songbirds aren't as affected, so they're not giving any guidelines yet to take down those bird feeders. So in terms of HPAI, bird feeders are safe but please keep them clean and please wash them at least every week or two with a diluted bleach solution. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna probably send, if you wanna send any of your questions, um, Sydney typed in the Wildlife Clinic's email in the chat. So if you have any more questions, um, please send it over to them. They're more than happy to answer. But really quick, um, Stephanie, you did cut out really slightly um, during the red tail um, hawk story. And I think people are really interested to see what happened. So if you want to really quickly go back and touch on that, we would love to hear what happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So I'm not going to pull up the, the slide again, but I'll quickly go over it again. Um, so there was a local police officer. He was a suburban police officer, shows up with the box, and he's like, I have a hawk who got stuck in party lights. And this is the summer, so we're expecting those big, giant patio lights and something easy to unwrap them with. Oh, no, it was Christmas lights that they had strung from their back deck along their patio to make a nice festive atmosphere. And I'm sure it looked pretty, but there was probably a yummy snack for the hawk, such as a mouse. And he couldn't see that wire between the lights. So when he dove for his meal, he completely got wrapped up in those Christmas lights. Um, I mean, it was very, very tight around his wing. It was so tight across his torso, he was having trouble breathing. We had to anesthetize him to literally cut the Christmas lights off him. He was very lucky in that the lights went around his wing and he didn't suffer any wing fracture. So he did make a full recovery and was released. But a lot of wing injuries we see, they, they're not recoverable or they do die from stress. So it's just being cognizant of every little thing that you use to decorate because every little thing could be detrimental. Okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. Yet another example of the amazing work that you guys do. And I don't know where the animals would be without you um, because our impact is so huge. Um, but I just want to give another big thank you, to Stephanie and Sydney, for the amazing presentation. So before we leave and end the night, if you guys want to say a quick thank you and unmute, go for it. But once again, thank you all for joining us for Thursday Night Live tonight. And I hope to see you next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Stephanie. Very good. Thank Great you. Presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>